the men who filled in in my behalf when I was gone. And also, I, uh, I hope and trust that the time that Gloria Shu shared with you about the Pregnancy Support Center was an encouragement to you and an encouragement about the work that she is doing through that important ministry here in Taichung. Of course, I'm grateful to all of you. I asked you to be faithful in your attendance, and you exceeded expectations, so thank you for that. I know it's a little bit more difficult in the summer season when we're off and doing different things, but uh, thank you for being faithful, and uh, the Lord uh, appreciates that faithfulness as well. Well, this week we are going to return to our study of Paul's letter to the Colossian church. And as you remember, we have been looking at the section in chapter 3 where Paul is giving us some wise instruction on God's plan for Christians in two particular areas of life. First, in the, uh, the midst of what we're in now is the, the, the family and God's instruction for the family. And then secondly, once we finish that in a week or two, God's instruction for Christians in the workplace. Now, the family unit is of great importance to God, so much so that he identifies specific roles for wives, for husbands, for children, and for parenting, which is what we'll look at next week. We first looked at a wife's duty to submit, that is, to voluntarily come under. Remember, we talked about this as a choice, a volitional choice by a wife to come under the leadership of her husband, as Paul says is fitting or right in the Lord. Then when I left you in May, we had just finished a husband's duty to sacrificially love his wife as Christ loved the church. And today we're going to turn our attention to the duties of children and then follow that next week. We'll complete our study of the family by looking at God's design for parenting. And this is not just a random addition or afterthought, but really it's the necessary companion to what we'll talk about today with obedience. Children are called and instructed to obey and what we'll learn next week is that parents have the primary role in teaching children how to do that. So it is a companion activity. Now, as I've done with the instruction for wives and husbands, I will expand our study of Paul's teaching for children to include its parallel in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 1 to 3. It's just interesting in our adult uh, small group, we're doing the same thing as we're looking at some passages in Colossians and then the expanded teachings on that in, in Ephesians. So the two books uh, have a lot of the same content, uh, Colossians being kind of more of a, a summary form of it and Ephesians being the broader teaching on that. So if you would please, let's open our Bibles up first to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and we'll see Paul's instructions to children in verse 20, Colossians 3 and verse 20, and then after I read that one verse, we'll turn back in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. So in chapter 3 of verse 20, Paul says this about children. Children, obey your parents, here's the key part of this, in all things, or maybe your Bibles say in everything, and then he gives us a reason, and the reason is, for this is pleasing to the Lord. So, very short, very pointed, children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Now, if you could turn back in your Bibles a couple of books, back up through Philippians, and you'll come to Ephesians, and in Ephesians chapter 6, Verses 1 to 3, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, Paul is also going to talk about the children's duty in a little bit more expanded fashion. Here's what he says. Children, obey your parents, so the same core foundational command, in the Lord. The reason here, for this is right. Verse 2, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And then again, another reason, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long in the land. Okay, so in our teaching, in Paul's teaching here today, in these two sections, he is going to first provide us with the duties 
of children or the obligations or responsibilities, any of those words could work, but the duties of children, and he follows that with the purpose or the reason for those duties. So point number one, the duties. We'll see that in the first part of chapter 3, verse 20 in Colossians, and then in that first part of verse 6 in Ephesians, and verse 2 in Ephesians. Paul follows those duties by giving children some reasons or the purpose in this command. So God's commands aren't without reason, and I think it's terrific that he gives us some very specific reasons. So we'll see the reasons or purpose of the duty to obey in the second part of verse 20 in chapter 3 of Colossians, the second part of verse 6 in Ephesians, and again in verse 3 in Ephesians. Okay, so with that, let's start by looking at the duties of children. In our two passages, Paul reveals two obligations for children and how they are to function in the Christian family. Now, the first and foundational obligation is to obey your parents. To obey your parents. And the second one is to respect your parents. So two primary things that Paul is calling children to. And by the way, these are commands. These are not options that he's proposing. Obey your parents and respect your parents parents. So the bedrock of the responsibility children is the word, is a word that conjures up a number of images in your minds and I think many of them are negative. And there are several reasons for this, chief among them which I think is a lack of understanding of how the Bible uses and intends to define the word obedience. So we're going to start there. We're going to start by looking at the word that Paul uses, the Greek word there, And it's a compound word, and I want to build up what that word is intended to mean, and then I want to propose a definition for that, a working definition that the children can use. So the word is actually a combination of a verb and a preposition, and the verb's basic meaning is uh, is to hear, to hear. Okay, so when Paul says to obey... He's talking about obeying in the context of hearing something. And then the preposition that is added to it means under. Okay, so to hear under is the general idea, though. So when we put those two things together, when the Bible uses the word obedience, what it is saying is to come under the hearing or the instruction, if you want to use another word, of an authority, and that authority, children, is your parents. So the fundamental way that this word is being used is not in a pejorative, heavy-handed, kind of judicial way. It's being used in a way that draws you into how you need to respond to your parents. Come under their hearing, and they are the authorities in your life. Now, God has ordained authority in your life, and it is your parents that he has ordained to fill that role. And we're going to learn in detail next week how your parents are exercising that authority in two particular areas. And those two particular areas are discipline and instruction. Now, by way of just a quick preview, turn, put your finger in Ephesians and turn back to the book of Proverbs because this is the central theme, really, of what Solomon is teaching his sons. The first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs is all about Solomon, King Solomon's instruction to his sons so that they will live a good life. Here's what he says in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 1. He says here, okay, now the Old Testament you know is in a different language, it's Hebrew, But there's a Greek translation of that as well. And the word here that we're looking at that is translated here is the exact same word that Paul uses for obey in Colossians. So here, my son, or obey my son, your father's discipline, and do not abandon your mother's 
instruction. Now why? Well, verse 9, they are a garland of grace for your head and an ornament around your neck. Okay, so really they adorn you is the idea. These are good things that God gives you and your parents and it's like wearing beautiful adorning jewelry is what he's trying to say through this poetic word that he does. So the baseline here is the idea of hearing and coming under that hearing of the authority of your parents. Okay, so turn back to where we were in Ephesians, and actually we'll back up to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. So with all that, here's how I'm going to define biblical obedience for you. To obey is to hear and to comply. That means follow or do what they say. To hear and comply with your parents' discipline and instruction. Okay, kids, so if you want to know what your responsibility is in the home, here it is in one simple statement. Now, it's a simple statement. I know you're going to tell me it's hard to do, and it may be at times, and there may be good reasons for that, but it doesn't change the requirement. And the requirement is to hear, that is, listen to your parents, and to comply, to do what they tell you to do in the areas of discipline and instruction. So, kids, first and foremost, job in your lives is to obey your parents. It is, in fact, the one lesson you need to learn as children. And that lesson, parents, needs to start from infancy. Don't think that these beautiful little children don't know how to sin. They are born that way. If you ever watch a young child manipulate a parent, you know it's in their hearts. And this job, parents, is a hard job, but it starts day one when God gives you the gift of a child. Now... In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20, and then in Ephesians 6, 1, Paul goes on to qualify first the scope or the range of your obedience, and then he's going to reveal an attitude that you should demonstrate or display in your obedience. In other words, you need to obey in a certain way. So there's the base command to obey, and then there is a way to do that well and correctly. So we're going to look at both of those things. Now the first is in Colossians 3 and verse 20. This is the scope or the extent of your obedience. And Paul says that you are to obey your parents in everything. In everything. Or maybe your translation says in all things. So kids, we're going to have some interactive parts here. What does that mean? What does it mean when Paul tells you to obey your parents in everything? Who has some ideas on that? Don't be embarrassed to speak up. You might have earned some points with your parents if you get it right. What do you think? Any kids want to offer any ideas on that? What about you, Elias? You got something? What about your brother, Matthias? You both are thinking about it, I can tell you. I can see in your faces. What's everything mean? What's that? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great way to say it. Okay. Basically, when he says everything, he's saying there's no exceptions. Nothing is left out. There is nothing that you are permitted in this command not to obey if your parents have given it to you. Now, I know you're smart kids, and you're probably thinking about this a little bit. It should be raising a question in your mind about your parents' authority. So, next question I have for you is, is there any legitimate limits on your parents of, you know, asking you to obey? Are there any legitimate limits on what your parents can ask you to do? What do you think? Any ideas? Is there anything your parents could ask you to do that you should? that wouldn't be included in that in everything statement? And if kids can't get it, parents can think about it too. What do you think? Anybody have any ideas? 
Yeah, so let's use the biblical word for that. What is it? If your parents ask you to sin, right? If your parents ask you to do something that is sinful, do you think that you can not obey that kind of directive? What do you think? Yes or no? It yeah. should be based on God's teaching, I think so. Yeah, absolutely, right? So if your parents ask you to sin, should you obey? And the answer, of course, is no. And the reason is no, because Paul does put a limit on it, okay? So if you just had this verse, right, and we take the Bible to be literal, then you don't have any choice, do you? But, if you will, turn back to Ephesians and look ahead with me to verse 4, you're going to see that Paul helps you, kids, with this broad responsibility to obey in everything when he says, fathers, and we really should extend that to mean fathers and mothers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction. And the last part of this verse is the key part of the verse. The discipline and instruction of who? Of the Lord. Of the Lord. Okay? So, what that means is that your parents' authority to discipline and instruct you and your requirement to obey is limited by their instruction and discipline reflecting what the Lord would say. So parents have an important responsibility in this to make sure that as they're asking their children to do various different things or to obey to various different things, that they are asking them to obey the things of the Lord. Now, where do we find the things of the Lord? Okay, I heard somebody whisper it. What was it? The Bible, of course, right? That's why we have this big book with all these different books in it. Okay, so that's where that comes from. So, kids, in other words, if mom or dad instruct you to do something that is outside of what Christ would permit, then you can respectfully appeal to them to change their request. You might say something like, mom or dad... I want to comply with your request. I want to obey what you're asking me. But if I did so, it would cause me to sin against God. Would you please reconsider your request? And parents, of course, hopefully, you will hear that in the spirit that it is offered by your children. And, and you can consider what they've asked. And you can decide whether or not you want to change the request. Now, children, be careful when you do this. Don't be reckless. And it kind of requires you to know your Bibles. Okay, so this is why we do what we do here when we teach you the different things in the Sunday schools. It's important for you to know what God says in his word so that you can appeal in a respectful way. And so I use that word appeal. Okay, so you're making a similar request back to them to think about that. So, not easy to do all the time, but that might be one way for you to consider that. Now, as we continue, um, Paul then also, if we back up in Ephesians to verse 1 of chapter 6, he notes an attitude that you should display in your obedience. And it is captured in this word at the end of verse 6. He says... Children, obey your parents. Then he has, again, this little phrase, in the Lord. Repay, obey your parents in the Lord. So I just told you what verse 4 said. It's the idea of they can only have authority to instruct you in the word, or in the Lord, of the Lord, and you are called to obey in the Lord. Now, it's kind of hard to maybe understand it in that simple sense. What it means is that your obedience should be as if you were receiving the instruction from your parents from Jesus himself. Okay, so God appoints your parents as his regents or his authorities in your life. 
And when they're speaking to you, they're speaking as if they're speaking for Christ. And so when it says in the Lord, what it means is that you should obey, have an attitude of submission to your parents and obedience as if Jesus himself were standing in front of you and asking you to do that. Now, do you think it would be easier for you to obey if Jesus was standing in front of you asking you to do that? What do you think? Parents are kids. Does that make it any easier? No, I, I agree with Matthias' head going this way. Why not? Why do you think? Remember the, remember the old person rule? The old person rule is I can't hear, so you've got to speak up a little louder. Go ahead, say it. What is it? obeying Jesus because it just it was Jesus but yet again it's helpful perhaps to think of it that way just think of your parents as representing what God wants for you in your life and and they're calling you to do various different things they are calling you and asking you to try to comply with the will of God in your lives so in this context then your obedience should have two visibly characteristic elements the first is that your obedience should be immediate and unconditional compliance with your parents' direction. Okay, immediate and unconditional. No on the third time, on the fourth time, no on if you don't do this you're going to get punished. None of that other stuff. When your parents ask you to do something, do it. And the second one, and this is also hard, is to do it with a joyful attitude. A joyful attitude. No grumbling. No stinky face. I love that Chinese expression. No stomping off and grumping in the way to the room. No attitude. Obey immediately. Obey with a joyful heart. Trusting in God that he has placed these parents over you for your good and for your sanctification. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to succeed all the time, but rather it is establishing a standard that you are striving to. And kids, this is no different than the standards the Bible gives your parents or any one of us to strive to comply with godly and godlike behavior. We're all going to stumble at times, we're all going to fall at times, but it doesn't change the standard. And when you fail, you need to be quick to confess your failure and repent of that, both to your parents and to the Lord. Because ultimately the Bible tells us that all sin is ultimately sin against God. David confesses that in Psalm 51 after his great sin towards Bathsheba. So, a couple of things about your attitude. Immediate compliance and joyful attitude. So kids, your baseline here of the duty in the home is to obey your parents. But then in verse 2 of Ephesians chapter 6, Paul gives us a second obligation, and that is to show respect for your parents. Look at how he says it here in verse 2. Verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 2, honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise. Now, Paul here is citing the fifth commandment from the Ten Commandments, and he's saying also that it's the first commandment that's given that has a promise associated with it, and we'll get to that in just a bit. And the idea here is that in addition to simply obeying and complying with your parents' request, you need to show them a certain amount of respect. Now, I think Paul adds this for two reasons. Number one is because displaying respect for your parents is a clear external expression 
of a submissive and obedient heart. Okay, just like baptism is a way that we demonstrate externally the internal decision we've made to follow Christ, the way that you show respect for your parents in complying with their direction is an external way of showing a heart that is obedient and a heart that is respectful towards your parents. Saying it from a negative perspective, displaying disrespect to your parents is a clear testimony of a disobedient and rebellious heart. So kids, when you are disobeying and when you are outright disobeying, it is rebellion in your own heart. You are fighting against something in your heart. I don't know what that did. You are fighting in your heart against something that you want more than you want God's will in your life. Now, a second reason I think is a bit more of a longer-term reason, and that is that honoring your parents is a wonderful lifelong way to demonstrate respect for their role in your life. Now, I have to admit that the East does this way better than the West. Um, one of the things I love about the Eastern culture is the respect that it has for elders and for parents. And I know some of that may just be duty in terms of the way the culture is, but I also see a genuineness to that. And it's a wonderful quality. In America, it's not that way. Kids get done, they leave, what do they want? They still expect their parents to give them money, do this, do that, and they're disrespectful, and they don't show the honor and respect. So parent, kids, your parents have a tough job. It's not easy. Um, but showing respect is a lifelong thing to do for your parents. There will be a time, and it may seem like it's a long ways away now, when you will not be under your parents' authority, but you will always have the opportunity to show them respect and honor throughout your life, no matter how good or how bad a job they may have done. So, two obligations, children, to obey your parents and to respect them. Now, these obligations have very specific reasons or purposes attached to them, but before I explore them, I want to kind of close this part and really solidify it in your minds with uh, four implications of obedience, four things that are important about obedience. The first one is this. Obedience honors and glorifies God. Your obedience honors and glorifies God. Now, you have a model for this obedience, and that model is Jesus. Jesus, in his earthly life, perfectly obeyed his parents, his earthly parents, and he perfectly obeyed his heavenly Father. And that's why, of course, he could be our perfect sacrifice. But the fact of the matter is, when you're demonstrating obedience, you are honoring and glorifying God because you are honoring and glorifying his design for you in the family. And that leads to the second one, which is that obedience is part of God's design for you. When you choose to live outside of God's design, your life will get harder and it will get more uncertain. Unequivocally, God will honor what he wants to have done. So when you are living in rebellion and disobedience, your life is going to get harder and there's going to be more uncertainty in your life. So this is a protection for you. It's not an oppression of you. It is a protection for you. The third thing is this, something I think you really need to remember. Obedience is always a choice. And it is a choice that reflects what is in your heart. There will never be a time, other than the one exception I told you about your parents asking you to sin, if they've made reasonable requests, there will never be a time when you can't obey. It'll always be, rather, a volitional choice not to obey. And you need to know that and own that as you go through the process. Now, even though I'm old, I was a kid once, and I can relate to all these things, okay? I'm not saying any of this is ever easy, and I'm not saying parents always do what they're supposed to do perfectly. But none of that changes God's command for how you respond. So a fourth thing in that is that obedience is a means of teaching you to trust God. Trust God. We have a heavenly Father who's going to work all things together for good for those who love him. 
And your obedience is helped, or it's a way for you to learn to trust God. I know in your minds you're going to think things are not what? Fair. It's not fair. You know, I find human beings say, God's not fair. And my response to that always is a question. Do any of you want God to be fair? Does anybody in here want God to be fair? Yes or no? Do you? Do you want God to be fair? Beth's saying no, why not? Because then I get what I deserve. Yeah, oh, perfectly stated. <laughs> I mean, couldn't be better stated. You'd get what you deserve, which would mean what? None of us would be here <laughs> listening to this message. Now, maybe you'd rather not be here listening to this message, but the fact of the matter is, if you want God to be fair, he has to get rid of all of us because he's holy, perfect, righteous, and just. So, no, that's never a valid excuse. This teaches you to trust God. And kind of a companion to that is that obedience to your parents is the training ground for your response to the gospel and your obedience to God. God, through Christ, calls all of us to repentance and belief. He calls all of us to forsake our sin and believe in the work of his son, Jesus Christ, so that our sins can be forgiven and we can have eternal life. Your parents is a training ground to prepare you to respond to God's command to repent and believe in his son. And that is the gospel and the most important act of obedience, kids, that any one of you can do in your life. Okay, well, with that, um, let's look at God's purpose for obedience. And we're going to find this, and again, in the second parts of these verses, and then in verse 3 of Ephesians. Now, I, I love that Paul immediately supports the duties of children with four reasons. It's almost as if he is anticipating a child's favorite objection to direction from their parents, or maybe better, their favorite question when they don't want to comply to their parents' will. So kids, what is that question? Your favorite question when you don't want to comply to your parents' will, here's a hint, it's a one-word question. What do you think that is? What do you think, Ava? Ah, uh, absolutely right. Why? Why? Ever hear that, parents? Kids ever say that? Now, did Paul say, comply with your parents if they can give you a good reason? Did he? Is that in any of your translations? Not mine. Okay. So, it's like he anticipates that, and it's the word why. Now, parents, I want to talk to you just for a quick second on this one. I can't tell you how many times I hear parents say something like, Oh, little Johnny, he's so cute. He's so inquisitive. He's always wanting to know why when I ask him to do something. And i got to tell you, Mom and Dad, this is never an innocent question. It is never an innocent question, or even an inquisitive one. It's a rebellious response to your authority. And if you permit it to persist, you are telling your child it is okay not to comply with your direction. And if you don't correct it, you're teaching your children that it is acceptable to negotiate with you. Right? Have you ever heard a frustrated parent say, Johnny, go pick up your toys. I'm going to give you three tries. What are you doing? <laughs> you're conditioning your children to believe that the first time doesn't matter. Okay? So, why is never an innocent question. It is always a question that you do. Now, I wasn't a believer when I was raising my kids, and when they asked the question, why, I used to say, why? Because we love you. M-I-C, if everybody's ever heard Mickey Mouse, <laughs> it's the song. Now, that was a terrible response. And I wish I had been a believer at that point in my life, but I wasn't. But the fact of the matter is, why is never an innocent question. So don't let that be. Now, as your children get older, and they demonstrate more responsibility, and if you think there is some genuineness, that there's something they want to learn, 
then as a parent, you have the ability to decide what it is. But when they're younger, it's never an innocent question. It's simply a desire not to comply with your direction. All right, well, back to God's purpose for obedience. Uh, we could surely find many more in the Bible, but Paul's going to give us four motives for obedience. Four motives for obedience. And the first one of these we find in Colossians. So again, turn back there if you're not in Colossians chapter 3. And again, back to verse 20. And the first, well, let me, let me read that course again. So, children, obey your parents in all things. So there we have the command and we have the scope of the command. And then we get the reason, okay? So it starts with this word for, indicating it's a reason. For this is pleasing to the Lord. So the first motive that you have, children, in obeying your parents is because it pleases God. It pleases God. Now, putting the two ideas together of obedience and pleasing the Lord, I like to think of this first uh, motive as reverent obedience. Reverent obedience. Because it conveys a proper fear of the Lord. In Ecclesiastes, um, yeah, in uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon sums up all the instruction that he has given in the book with this command. The end of the matter is this. Fear God and keep, or maybe differently, obey his commandments. So there is really no higher or greater good in life than to please the Lord. And this, frankly, is a good motive for any one of us in the room that are Christians and following Christ's life. Um, it's, in fact, something that Paul conveys to us in both the book of 2 Corinthians and the book of Ephesians, where he says, respectively, that it should be first our ambition to let your desire your motivational reason for doing something. It should be our ambition to be pleasing to the Lord. But then I love what he says also in Ephesians, and that is that we need to be learners, or we need to learn how or what is pleasing to God. Okay, we need to learn that. So it's not something we're innately born with. We have to seek out what is pleasing to the Lord. And of course, again, our source for that is the Bible. So, our first motive here, kids, is that you obey your parents in everything because when you do that, you are pleasing God in what he wants for you and the design. Paul's emphasis on pleasing the Lord in Colossians as the motive for obedience stems, again, from God's design for order in the family unit. If there wasn't structure in order, your family would be chaos. It would be an absolute mess. Now, husbands are to sacrificially lead their wives. Wives are to voluntarily come under. Children are to obey. So your obedience in the home is the training ground for learning how to live in the structures that God has designed for an ordered society. One of the attributes of our God is he is ordered. There's things make sense in what he has created. So that's the first motive. Let's turn back again to Ephesians and we'll look at the second motive in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. And the second motive is stated this way. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. And then the reason is for this is right. So in other words, obeying your parents is the right thing to do. Not complicated, not hard, not a whole lot more to belabor here. Paul's point is simply that obedience reflects righteous character. And it is the right thing to do. Proverbs 21 and verse 3 says it this way, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifices. Okay, now, sacrifices were a major component of the Old Testament law for the Jewish people. <clears throat> it was the way that they interacted and related to God. They were commanded to do them. But what the proverb is saying is that, forget all that stuff, just do what is right and just, and that will be more acceptable to the Lord. So, in um, the famous words of the Nike company, one of my favorites, 
the sneaker and athletic company, they have a tagline, and their tagline is this. Just do it. Okay? So, as you are instructed, your motive is to just do it because it is the right thing to do. And the right thing to do is then attendantly pleasing to the Lord. Now, the final two motives come to us in uh, verse 3. And those two motives are what I'm going to call the quality and the quantity, or maybe the length, of your life. The quality and the length of your life. So if I said it in other words, your obedience is going to affect how well and how long you live. So look at verse 3 in chapter 6 and note what Paul says. He, after saying, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, he gives you the reason, the reason, so that, or why? Why should I do that? Well, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long in the land. So he's saying that as you are obedient to your parents, in general, it's going to go well with you and you're going to live a long and prosperous kind of life. Now, I want to temper that statement by saying it is a proverb versus a promise. And what I'm trying to say to you by that is that a, a proverb is a way of stating a general truth, but it's not an absolute promise. Okay? It's a general truth that will generally come true. So, you are not promised a good quality of life and a long life if you are obedient, but rather as a general rule, obedience and respect, uh, obedience and respect are going to foster self-discipline and in turn bring stability, longevity, and harmony in your lives. On the other side, disobedience and dishonor towards your parents fosters chaos leading to instability, a shortened life, and just go back and read the Old Testament if you think you've got it bad today, kids. If you were an unruly child, do you know what the penalty for what was in the Old Testament? Any kids happen to know? Adults know? They kill you. Literally. I'm not kidding. Go back and read the Old Testament again. Children that dishonor their parents, dishonor their right, they had the ability to put them to death. So I don't think that's what Paul's getting at here, but your life could be shortened in that. God is going to make sure that you don't harm yourself through your disobedience and disharmony. So what I'm trying to say with all this is, as opposed to obedience being viewed as a burden that is imposed upon you, what I'd like you to think about this is that rather it is actually self-serving for you to obey. It is self-serving for you to obey. Because Paul says here, proverbially, that as you do that, as a general rule, there's going to be peace and harmony in your life, and that you are going to live a long life. You're not going to do things that are potentially going to cause dire things to happen in your life. Now, that could come about in a, in a number of ways. It could be disobedience and uh, getting involved in things like drugs and alcohol that are bad, and that could cause horrible outcomes. But the fact of the matter is, this is actually self-serving. It's not a burden God is putting on you. It's something that serves you well when you do it well. So, I love the way that one young pastor that I talked to, again, I mentioned I was not a Christian when I was raising my children, and I was asking him, you know, what do you, what do you train your kids when they're young? And I'm thinking he's going to come back, well, I want to make sure they know the Lord and who Jesus is. And immediate reply was obedience. Like, oh, okay, why that? And he talked about it. I said, well, what do you do when they disobey? He said, well, um, until they learn obedience, their world is going to get smaller and smaller. And all he was trying to say with that is that until you can learn to obey consistently in one sphere or one scope of things, I'm not going to expand your responsibilities, your ability to do other things. So when I say that obedience is self-serving, 
It's so serving in the sense that as you demonstrate your ability to follow your parents' direction, they can loosen the reins on you and give you more responsibility. But when you can't handle that responsibility and you do things irresponsibly or disobediently, that world's going to get smaller until you have been trained how to respond to your parents in an obedient manner. So again, when I say it's self-serving, I mean exactly how I say it. If you want more in your life, kids, the way that you're going to get there is demonstrate to your parents through your obedience that you can responsibly handle what they're asking you to do. And as you demonstrate that, they can, in their wisdom as your parents, expand your world and give you more opportunity to grow and learn. And look, it is their job to prepare you to live in this world. And you live in a cocoon in your homes right now. It's nice, it's warm, it's safe, it's friendly. But when you go out into the outside world, you're not going to experience that. So they are trying to prepare you for that in your life. So I want you to look at obedience as an opportunity versus a burden. So let me quickly conclude all of this today uh, by saying this. I had said earlier in the message that obedience finds its ultimate focal point in God. Its ultimate focal point in God. The implication or maybe application of this principle then is to see obedience as aligning your will to do God's will. Obedience seeks to do what God commands you to do in Scripture by surrendering your will to God's authority and base everything you think, you say, and you do on God's word. That is the purpose and the ultimate implication of obedience, children, so that you can submit your will to God's will. We have trouble in life when we try to exert our will against God's will. As you bend to his will, as you submit and come under his will, you will feel that warm embrace and all of the beauty that comes with that. So next week, you were patient. Kids, come back again, and we'll be talking about obedience from the perspective of your parents' responsibility to raise you. So come back, and you can hear what God requires of them. Let's bow and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this teaching that you have given to us through the Apostle Paul. Thank you that you have thought so deeply and thoroughly about matters that we might overlook, something as simple as a child's duty and obligation to obey their parents. And Father, I'm grateful also that it's just not stated as a standalone command or just as a rule to follow, but rather in your kindness you condescend to explain to us the purpose and the reasoning behind your command to obey. And Father, we're thankful for those purposes. We're thankful for knowing that ultimately that purpose is so that we can submit and obey to your will and come under the safety that we find in confessing faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this time this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.